welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to episode 70 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week's a really special episode and I get to talk to Andy Shell of the 59... This week's a really special episode and I get to talk with Andy Shell from 59north.com uh, and from the On The Wind podcast. If you recall, they started originally as the 59 North podcast. Andy's published over 250 episodes now and was uh, my example and role model when I established the Ocean Sailing podcast almost three years ago. So it was a great opportunity to talk to Andy uh, personally for the first time. Uh, we've exchanged emails over the years, uh, but it was a real thrill to talk to Andy about his plans uh, and the lessons he's learned with his podcast and with his business and, and, this, and the opportunities he has ahead of him now with his new yacht Ice Bear, which is a stunningly beautiful 59-foot swan designed yacht i'm currently on board ocean gem berthed at the west haven marina in auckland just adjacent to the, the royal new zealand yacht squadron which is uh, pretty cool and uh, i sailed from southport uh, to opua to auckland in late march in the middle of march and we had a great seven day crossing of the tasman and really really nice weather and uh, then sailed down the northeastern coast of uh, the North Island of New Zealand uh, to Auckland where I'm holed up here for about two and a half weeks in a really nice weather and uh, preparing for the return crossing from Auckland to Norfolk Island to Southport departing April 3rd. So still one spot left on that crew for that trip uh, and a special deal available on that. So drop me a note if you're interested. Uh, We're departing Auckland April 3rd and en route to Southport. Enjoy this week's episode with Andy Shell. People walk into me and say I'm sorry. David, greetings. Hey Andy, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm very excited. It's um it's amazing to finally talk to you after all this time. Yeah, I kind of had I actually had it on my calendar to talk today uh, and I saw your email and I was like, well, let's just do it now because I, I kind of had I have some time right now. Crew don't come till tomorrow. And believe it or not, we're actually ahead of schedule. So this is this is great. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. And um, I mean, it's, it's such a privilege to talk to you. Um, you were, you know, you were my inspiration in, in launching the Ocean Sailing podcast three years ago. And uh, you've always been so generous and supportive with your advice, even by email. So uh, I just want to say thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thanks for the compliments. All right. Well, I've I've prepared a list of questions for you, so uh, so I'm I'm not sure how you want to t- tackle this, but um, I think the the interviewer is about to be interviewed. Uh, if that's okay. That's great, man. Fire away. It's great because I I can actually just react to your questions instead of having to think one step ahead all the time. So this is going to be relaxing for me. <laughs> that's good. It's good. Well, um, I mean, straight out of the block. So I really want to ask you, I guess. <clears throat> What your what your original driver was for launching what was the you know the fifty nine North podcast maybe I don't know four four something or or so years ago now and it's it's now become the the on the the wind podcast and and you know what what was the driver for that and how how different is it today from your original vision? Yeah, uh, it was actually it's going on, on this coming September it'll be six years so it's been a while now. Um, but uh, I think the initial, uh, it was just a creative outlet for me, I think. I mean, I'd always, like way back in the day, I'd always wanted to write for some of the sailing magazines, just like the people that I read about. You know, I, I always talk about John Kretschmer. He was like my biggest influence to, biggest inspiration to like how I've set up my career. And, you know, I'd seen him writing books and writing magazines and stuff. And I was like, oh, I really want to do that. And I, I did manage to get in some magazines and still do that but then I just started listening to podcasts myself as a as a fan of other po- non sailing related podcasts, just just whatever. And uh, I was like, man, this is this is really cool. I think I could do this and I, I'd like to do it. So it was truly just a creative. There was no business thought behind it whatsoever. It was purely a creative outlet. And it was kind of like, well, here's a way that I can I can have an excuse to interview some of these people in sailing who may never have uh, otherwise talked to me. And it actually, 
it actually started out uh, as this podcast called Two Inspired Guys. So before the sailing thing even started, I did two, or I did thirty episodes of this other podcast with my college roommate, where the original idea was a bit wider. It was talking to people who had made careers out of the things they're passionate about across all sort of industries, I guess. Um, but I found out that like all the people I was ended up talking to were sailors. And I said, well, let, let's just narrow the focus a bit. And, and Ryan and I had moved away from each other. We weren't together uh, physically anymore. So it was just, it, I ended up doing most of the interviews anyway. So that just evolved into the, the sailing one. Um, and those first 30 episodes was kind of me learning how to do a podcast, both style wise and with the technical stuff. And then, uh, yeah, so it's, it's always been, I guess the second part of your question was how has it evolved? It still remains to this day a, an excuse for me to talk to cool people. Um, so it, it is purely a creative outlet. Um, it, it's now the base, the foundation of our entire business, which is, was a happy accident, which I've talked about before. But, um, but I think the motivation remains that sort of pure creative outlet. I just, I really like, I really like sitting down and talking to people. But at the same time, I have some social anxiety, so it's easier if I have a reason to talk to people than it is just going out and mingling at a happy hour event. I can't, I hate doing that, but I can, I can sit down and interview someone, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it makes complete sense, and it's a, it's a fascinating parallel, because I, I often tell people I, I get to have conversations I'd never get to have with really interesting people about sailing, and, and that's right, without, without a podcast, I'd... I doubt I could just sit down uh, candidly and have the same conversation um, just across the table with a complete stranger. So it is, it's a fascinating parallel. Um, really is. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, the, the, the happy accident business wise thing, I mean, we would have started the boat business whether or not I had the podcast, I think. And I just realized that I had this foundation to build on. And um, I mean, I guess this is, <laughs> This is kind of weird, but my my initial motivation, I started listening to this podcast called the Nerdist podcast, the Chris Hardwick thing. And he basically it's it's sort of similar parallel thing. He built this whole nerd empire on top of this podcast and and kind of by accident. And that's I don't really listen to that anymore because um, he's gone really big. But that that's kind of the, a similar parallel to what we've ended up doing. Mm -hmm. And. When, when I started, you introduced me to Squarespace and Libsyn and Hindenburg and tools I still use today. But when, when you started almost six years ago, did, were those tools available then or, or have you had to overcome a few technical challenges to get to you know new, newer technology today that really makes the production and publishing you know process probably a bit smoother than it might have been in the early days? Yeah, I still use. I don't. I I started out just using GarageBand, um, and then I, you know, I'm entirely self-taught when it comes to the sound tech stuff. Um, so it was a, it was learned by experience. And if you go back and listen to the early episodes, it's, um, it, it's gotten a lot better sound quality wise. Uh, hopefully, my interviewing skills have gotten better too. They ought to by now, having done 250 episodes. But anyway, uh, the the tech the tech side um, has definitely evolved. I still use Libsyn. Um, that's been great and simple and just it's easier to stay on one platform. Uh, Hindenburg was, I discovered, I think probably halfway through uh, since we started and that I, I like as well. It was designed for um, for radio journalists. So it's uh, most of the other um, sound kind of applications are, are more music based. So Hindenburg is specific to, to audio journalism. So it's easy to use. Um, but my tech setup, I started out just with using a zoom h4n just just the the onboard mic on that and long story short i've evolved now where i use uh when my when i do my in-person interviews and what i'm talking to you on right now i use um the zoom as an audio interface in the computer but then i have uh neumann kms 105 mics and they're basically stage mics used by sort of vocal uh, vocalist singers think like adele instead of metallica like people that want to emphasize their voice use this kind of mic and and um, it's great because it's for my mobile studio like it it picks up just what I'm talking uh, and a, just a tiny bit of ambient noise in the background um, and I found that's been the best quality. They're super expensive. I sp I've spent a ton of money on gear over the years, but I, I enjoy the process and the learning part of it. And you know, since it's the business, I can I can justify it kind of. But uh, that's that's my current setup. Uh, I actually have a Zoom H6n now. That's got four XLR inputs, and then I've got uh, the two Neumann mics, and then I have two Shure handheld mics if we do like a four-person chat. So that's I think I think we're 
I'm very happy with the quality anyway. The sound production, I think, has gotten we're, – we're pretty darn good, I think, on that side. Uh, it's, it's really, really good, uh, and especially given some of the environments you're recording in. And I've, I've had some challenges at times when um, there's a recording inside a yacht at Anchorage and you can hear the slap, slap, slap of the water against the hull in the background. It's quite, a, it's quite annoying when you listen to it afterwards, even though it didn't seem that bad at the time. So, uh, yeah, that's, those things are really important. Yeah, and I and I think this year I've started um, playing around with filming some stuff as well because uh, the kind of the podcast format has always been like you, you people have told me anyway it feels like they're just a fly on the wall listening in on this conversation so I thought well let's just stick a camera and literally make it feel like that and I started doing that so we just yesterday launched our third video podcast on YouTube so it's exactly the same format it's just we put a camera in the room that's kind of a silent observer. And, um, I've gotten some awesome feedback from it, uh, so far. So that's been fun to do and, and kind of learning some of the filming aspects of it now. Cause I, I always said, I'm not going to do it unless I can do it really well. And I've collected a, a lot of photography equipment over the last couple of years that also works reasonably well for filming stuff like that. So that's been fun, fun to learn that side of it too. Oh, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, so it's like a, it's a video cast in parallel to a podcast almost, um, yeah, it's just exactly the same thing, and I I, I release it, um, you know the like the video that came out yesterday, I put that out before the audio just because I want to get some episodes on on our YouTube channel, but the the audio will be identical to what's in the video, so it'll be in because some people like I don't I don't watch YouTube personally, but I know a lot of people do, and a lot of people I think it's a different audience. People that watch YouTube don't necessarily listen to podcasts and vice versa, so we're thinking of ways to sort of how do we grow the audience on the podcast and that's one relatively easy way to do it um because it's it it's not a ton of extra effort and at the same time doing the video forces me to do it in person uh and the interviews always come out better when you're talking face to face with someone so that's one of my goals for this year is record more interviews in person and then the ones i am doing in person film them and just have a little bit of fun with that mm-hmm well, that's fascinating, and I want to just jump straight to a, a question I had down there to, to I guess, to, to ask you about, and that's really the the way your your imagery has evolved, and you you, you know you've turned into a multimedia business almost with the drone footage and the higher quality video and everything you capture and share now via Facebook and Instagram, and it's just it's been like a, a dramatic I guess evolution of the business in the last two years, especially I, I would probably say, and and I mean from. From your point of view, how how has that changed the the business and what you now capture and share, and then what you now have to do in terms of equipment and technology and and planning and capturing to be able to manage what you you're producing now? Yeah, great question. I have a very there's a very specific starting point to the imagery side, and that's when we had James Ostrom's come along to Scotland with us last year. James is a friend of mine who I met um, through my friend Clint Wells. We it's a long story. I don't have to get into it. But anyway, James is a friend, but he's also um, a photographer and has only recently started working with it professionally, but he's just extremely talented. And we, and he's, he's also like a big outdoorsman. He's not a sailor, but he's really into climbing and camping and hiking and doing some pretty, he's been a climber his whole life. So I guess that's his sort of foundation. But we said when we were doing this Arctic, when we were planning this fall bar trip, I immediately said to James, I was like, hey, James, I, I want you to come along to document this because I really like your photography. And I knew he'd be up for the adventure because he spent some time in the Norwegian Arctic, not Svalbard, but up in Lofoten. And he was like stoked immediately. So we ended up having him come to Scotland with us for three weeks as sort of a test so he could get used to being on the boat. And we, he could see if he enjoyed the sailing side of it. We knew he would, but it was kind of just, Hey, why don't you come to Scotland with us? And when I saw the pictures that he was getting out of that trip, I was like, Holy smokes. Like I can't, I can't go back to posting iPhone photos on our Instagram account after having this, like this is just totally changed the whole thing. Um, and I've, you know, I've always been semi interested in photography. I've always had a, you know, an, an SLR camera, but I never, I, I just had the, you know, the SLR with a kit lens that came with it and didn't, that was about it. Put it on automatic and the photos looked better than your phone, but I didn't really know what I was doing. So James, James was the inspiration for that. And, uh, I started collecting it's, it's, it's hard having a business where you're also able to like buy stuff through the business that you want to buy anyway. It's very, <laughs> it's very, it's, it's good in one sense cause you can save a bit of money, but it's, it's, uh, it's dangerous in another sense. So anyway, 
I started collecting camera equipment since James came with us, and um, and he's taught me a lot about lent, different lenses, how to use the camera, how to edit in post. I, I started shooting in RAW after sailing with him, um, and the goal was with it always. You know, I really like James's style because they're they're real photos. I, I and actually nowadays on Instagram, it's very easy to stand out because. 99% of people's Instagram photos, unless you're you're following a professional photographer, they're just iPhone photos with a ton of filters on them, and and they look fine until you put them up against some somebody like James, and it's like wow, this is you know. So we made a a rule: no more iPhone photos on our Instagram feed unless they're in the stories, which are kind of a bit different. Um, and just that alone has like really helped build the Instagram following because it's so easy to stand out now. And, and I was saying James's style is more natural. They're not, you know, it's, it's like, how did this look in the moment? Let's, let's go for that instead of over editing and stuff like that, that tends to happen. So long story short, that's how it all started. And, and then I did realize that, especially in sailing, you know, the Volvo ocean race does an amazing job with their media, with their onboard reporters and stuff. But aside from them, there's not really anybody else even making an attempt so especially in the offshore side of things, you know, you got a lot of YouTube channels and stuff, but we have this unique opportunity because we're doing, you know, these deep ocean sailing stuff where we can get the drone up and get some footage that just nobody else has. Um, and that's been fun trying, you know, I'm, I tend to be a bit competitive as well, but just trying to say, all right, we're going to set the standard here because we have this unique opportunity. So let's take advantage of it. <laughs> and at the same time, it's really freaking fun flying the drone off the boat offshore. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and you I mean, you've gone to some amazing places, but I mean, the Arctic footage was just incredible, but you have just, you've brought it, you've turned something into reality for people that could only try and picture or imagine to see it firsthand with the footage you captured, particularly with the drone was just it was just stunning. It was really just incredible. I really, you know, I can't say enough about it. It just was so captivating. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm really stoked for the for the Delos stuff to come out because you know we got a lot of still photography, but they've got all the video stuff. So really excited to see what they do with that. And and obviously we just announced this book that we're doing. Um, so we we did like a coffee table photo book based on mostly James's photos and and then some of my writing and stuff. So I'm really excited about that. And I I guess to sort of summarize what we're talking about. I've, I've said this before as well. My dad always, my, my parents gave really good advice, two pieces together. My mom said, do what you love and the money will follow. And she was a little more philosophical. And my dad, the more practical guy always said, just be the best at whatever you decide to do, whatever that is. And you'll, you'll always be successful. If you just strive to be the best, you'll, you'll find success, whatever industry you're in. So those are two really powerful pieces of advice. And, and the being the best thing we've really latched onto lately in, in, if we're going to do something, we're going to do it 110%. Um, and that's why it's taken so long for us. You know, we don't have a YouTube channel, so we can't compete with Delos. So, hey, Delos, why don't you guys come along? Um, that that kind of thing. And, okay, well, we're not going to do photos on Instagram unless they're super high quality. And and it just it's, it's easy to stand out when you start having that attitude. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Um, and hugely satisfying when you pull it off. Um it really, really must. Um, so, so I mean, we're jumping to the some of my final questions, but that's okay. We're going to go in any order at all. Um, but I mean, tell me about your book, Eighty Degrees North, and, and the the story you captured with your trip to the Arctic, and how did that all unfold? The idea for for creating a book like that. Yeah, sure. Um, so when we invited James along to come to the Arctic, um, we, he, we did not pay him when he came to Scotland. That was just like a, I paid all of his expenses, but that was just like a test trip. Like I said, but obviously coming to the Arctic, he was going to be with us for two months. So a, I, I wanted to pay him cause he was going to be working for it. Uh, and B he needed to get paid cause he had to leave his work for two months. Um, so we, when we decided we were going to do that, we said, all right, well, we're going to, we're going to bring James along, but it's so easy nowadays with digital photography to just, you wind up with a hard drive full of photos and you look at them on your computer and your phone, but it felt, that felt like a waste. It's like, we got to do something. We got, we got all this amazing imagery. We got to do something cool with it. So right off the bat, we had this idea that we're going to do a, a, make a, a photo, like a coffee table photo book. And Mia and I like collecting those kind of books anyway. So that just, that was in the back of our heads from day one. Um, but we didn't really do anything with it until we got back off the boat last fall. But one thing that I was really good about was 
writing during the trip, like keeping a very detailed kind of journal, blog, whatever you want to call it, during the actual trip. So that became the foundation for the text that ties the whole book together. Um, and we have this, we had this neighbor back in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We were trying to find out like, okay, who's going to do this book? Because we knew a real publisher wouldn't probably take it because it's kind of a bit too niche and was marketing. You know, we wanted to do it how we wanted to do it. We didn't want a publisher telling us how to do it. So we're like, who, who can we get to design the book? And we remembered this, our neighbor back in Lancaster, he had worked for the music industry and is a freelance designer and, and had done some of these books like this before for bands and stuff. And we're like, oh man, this is perfect. We're going to, we're going to use Tom. So the whole, the, the vision for the book was, all right, kind of like I just said a minute ago, we're going to make a coffee table book. How can we make this the coolest, best thing we can do? So every single detail of the book is, is thought of is conscious. So like I went to Tom when we got home in October last year, Mia and I went back to Lancaster and sat on his couch and said, okay, Tom, like we want to hire you because you have this creative ability that I don't have. It's kind of like music. I, I can appreciate good music, but I can't make it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a musician. So I said to Tom, look, Hey, you're a designer. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't even know what I have in my head, but I have a, I have confidence in you. I've seen his work. I said, you take this and run with it and go to the extreme. Like we don't have a publisher. We don't, there's no rules. Just make it as cool as you possibly can. So like every single detail from the font choices to the layout of the chapters, to the cover design, uh, one really cool little Easter egg thing we have, it's a hardcover book. And do you know what the dust jacket is? That's like the, that's like the cover that, that wraps around the hardcover. So that, since we're not getting it published by a publisher can be whatever we want it to be. So the, basically the, the, the cover image wraps around the entire dust jacket and there's no text. It's just this one giant image with the only text is on the spine of the book. But then if, if the reader takes the dust jacket and removes it from the actual cover of the book, it's printed on the inside and there's a map on the inside that shows highlights of some of the things where they happened on the map that we then talk about in the book. So that's kind of a little Easter egg that you're not going to find unless you physically take the book apart. Well, wow, so that's, stuff like that's that. really cool. That's really, really cool. And the clever use of space that's so many blank and unused. That's really, really smart. Yeah, exactly. And I'll tell you what, though, we started, Tom's like, all right, send me maybe your favorite 200 photos and I'll work with that. And Mia and I went through and did the first edit, and we got down to 430. <laughs> it's like, oh my god! So it was. I mean, it's. We had to re sort of reevaluate the vision. It, Tom actually asked us. He he got he got all the photos. He's like, guys, I'm having trouble with this. He's like, what is this? Is this a travel log of your guys' trip, or is it an art book? So we decided, nope, it's an art book. Um, that centered the, the vision was it's an art book that centers on exploring the high Arctic in a sailboat. So basically we had to just cut out a lot of stuff that we, that we would have liked to have as a travelogue thing, but that is unnecessary. Uh, it's like, it's like editing anything, you, you, you know, the, the final product is going to be better for the fact that we edited it and nobody else is going to know what's missing except for us. Yeah. And that's right. When you've got so many memories where you are in the moment and they come straight back to you, but to the, but to the reader, they went there. So the, the attachment's quite different. And I mean, I kind of liken it to, I mean, I, I, I seem to have this, this need to take lots of photos of sunsets and every sunset is slightly different. And I can sit down after a trip and have 50 photos of, sun, of sunsets, but to anybody else, they're just sunsets. But to me, they're, they're all different. But, you know, if you have to be brutal, sometimes you've got to, you've got to pick and choose, don't you? Um, yeah, exactly. And that, that's exactly what it was like. And we, we decided that, um, you know, the, the book kind of has a very nice, flow to it because it starts just as we're crossing the Arctic Circle going north and it ends just as we cross the Arctic Circle coming south and making landfall in Iceland. So it's it's purely about us sailing in the Arctic and that adventure that entailed. And a big chunk of it is is with Delos up north because that was a lot of the time in Svalbard, but it's not just that. It's it's the whole sort of into the Arctic exploring the Arctic and then coming back out again. So it, it has a very nice flow to it as a story. And, and you can kind of, you can read the text and get the story, or you can just look at the photos and still get the whole story. But if you, if you do it together, you get, you get, you know, the most amount of detail, but they both sort of stand alone. Cause that's kind of how coffee table books is, isn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can't I can't wait to buy and read a copy. And, and so for people listening to this, I, I will link to it as well from the Ocean Sailing Podcast site. What's the best place for me to link to for, or for anyone listening to just go look this up to get to go buy a copy? Yeah, sure. It's it's smack on our front homepage. So it's 59-north.com. It's right there on the front page. Or if you go to uh, 59-north.com slash 80north, it's, it's right there and it'll always be there. And one more little sort of Easter egg thing I can talk about. I haven't we haven't talked about this publicly. We will eventually. Um, we had a we had this challenge. Like we wanted to sign the books, but we wanted James to sign them and Delos to sign them as well because they were all a big part of it. And in, in fact, um, there's a couple stories that Delos actually writes in the book, and there's some of their photography as well. So it's like, how are we going to do this? We can't like we're all scattered. You know, Kirill from Delos, he's back in Vietnam. James is in the UK. The, the the rest of the gang on Delos is in the Caribbean. We're actually going to see them in a few weeks when we sail to Antigua. But like how we can't ship 250 books around the world. That's just not going to happen. So uh, so what we ended up doing was we picked four photos that didn't make it into the book and had them printed as like six by nine size full bleed postcards. So there's there's four different photos, and when you buy the book, you won't know which one of those photos you're going to get. But we're, as we speak right now, they're being shipped around the world. They went to James first. He just got them yesterday. James is sending them to Kirill. Kirill's going to send them to Delos, and then we're going to meet up with Delos in the Caribbean and sign them. So you're going to get a one kind of unique photo that's been signed by all eight of us who were up there on the boat, and that's going to be an insert. They'll get sent then back to our designer, Tom who will stick them in each book. And then Tom is hand numbering each book uh, himself personally. So another another sort of unique thing we can do because we didn't have a publisher and and, uh, and that's kind of the way we decided to, to sign the book. So our sort of thought is that you'll be able to get this photo and if you stick it in a double-sided frame, you'll have the photo on one side and, and all the signatures on the other side. So that's that's kind of fun too. Yeah, that's a really, really nice touch as well. That's really, really nice. Yeah, so that's that's uh, you, you've heard it here first. <laughs> that's excellent. And so, Andy, so t- like, take me back to your Arctic trip preparation originally, and and you know that you were talking about that for some time um, prior to the trip. But it's a you know I've been to some places that are isolated, but no place that's that isolated and that cold, and where the risks can kind of can go through the ceiling in terms of what can happen up there and. So, I mean, how how did you go about preparing for the unknown kind of unknowns? Given it's not just you and me, it's not just you and friends and family. It's it's you taking you know clients here as well. Um, so, how did you prepare for that? Yeah, so I actually in the January issue of Yachting World, I have an article about the the mental side of that preparation, which we should have spent more time on than we did, um, but. Basically, the, the boat stuff, it, it, it's pretty simple. I, I think Svalbard's considered one of the sort of more accessible high Arctic destinations because, yes, there's a lot of ice up there, but there's not. it's not like uh, the Northwest Passage or you don't have any sea ice, um, at least in the more well-traveled areas. So in that sense, pretty much you don't need to do anything special to the boat other than have a, you know, a proper sound – If if the boat's set up to go on a real long ocean voyage, it's not really you don't really need anything different up there. The only thing I'd say was nice. We had heat. Uh, we installed the diesel heater. So boat preparations are pretty straightforward. Nothing really different about that. Um, but the mental side of things, the whole time we were up there, I was just on edge and in a good way. you need to you kind of need to be on edge so you're you you never you can never let your guard down. Um, and I was on, I, re, I didn't really realize this, but I had been on edge like in the whole year leading up to this trip because of that unknown stuff. And it just, it wore on me physically. And I started noticing, this is all the way back in 2017. I started noticing like when I was out running that I could, I could feel my heartbeat like in a way that was like more than normal. And it just somewhere in the back of my head, you know, I'm going to be 35 next week. And I, my grandfather has had heart problems and somewhere in the back of my head, I just started thinking like, gosh, maybe I have like a, maybe I have like a heart problem. I, you know, I never go to the doctor cause I rarely get sick. So it's like, shit, maybe I should do something about this. And I, I, but I didn't, I just sort of kept ignoring it. And finally this came to a head 
we're in Sweden on the west coast of Sweden. May 1st, crew arrived for the first passage over to Scotland. It was still really cold. The weather was really crappy, and now it's like getting real. And we had had a a scare with the new engine because we had a faulty oil pressure alarm. And this was like the day before crew were coming. And I was like, God, you got to be kidding me. So that that was like a, a sort of really stressful thing that happened like right before crew got there. It turned out to be nothing. But um, it just really I was I was really on edge. And we got a little weather window to sail over to Denmark. And on that trip, I was just like I'd kind of reached my limit mentally. And I said to Mia, like, and I could really feel my heartbeat then. I was like, Mia, I have to go see a doctor in Denmark before we continue this trip because I can't, I need to, I need to eliminate this heart thing because if we get up to Svalbard and I actually do have a problem, that's going to be a huge problem. So we, Mia made an appointment and we went to this little clinic in Skagen in Denmark and um, long story short, the, the nurse, the, the, the doctor that gave me, um, that, that talked to me, she's like, yeah, you definitely have anxiety, uh, and given what you guys are about to do, you deserve to have anxiety. She's <laughs> like, she's like, I'm not gonna. So I said, well, you know, can I get like, can I get like, is there like medicine you can give me in case I have like a panic attack? Because my my dad has anxiety issues as well, uh, so it kind of runs in the family. Um, and and she's like, well, she's like, yes, I I can give you a prescription. She's like, there's two things I can give you. One basically will knock you out and you will no longer be able to perform your duties as skipper if you take that like in a crisis moment. And I was like, well, that's probably not a good idea. And then she said, the other one is more long term. And she said, you can take this, but you're going to get even more anxious for about a month before your body gets used to it. And I was like, well, I definitely don't want that. It's not good timing. So, (laughs) So she said, she said, what I can do, she's like, I can give you an EKG right now to tell you, to show you that your heart is fine. And I was like, yes, please, let's, let's do that. So she did. And, uh, and of course my heartbeat was fine and normal and healthy. And she did a basic, you know, physical checkup on me as well. And, and as I suspected, I I am perfectly healthy. Um, but that, that was all I needed. Like that, somebody else telling me you are okay. You just have to manage your anxiety. That was like flipping a switch. And from that day forward, I was still on edge, but not in that sort of, I feel my heartbeat and I don't know what's going on kind of way. It was more like I'm on edge and I'm in control of this situation because I'm on edge and we're not letting our guard down because things can change in a hurry. Um, so that was, and I, and I should, you know, the, the moral of the story is I should have gone to that doctor's appointment during the six months break we had in Sweden while we were at home. And I should have dealt with this a long time ago and I didn't. And that was the stupid thing. I, thankfully I did before it was too late. Um, so to I guess to answer your preparation question, that's the one thing I would have done differently is is taking care of myself before everything else. And and I think you tend to forget that when you're doing these big trips that that that's a huge part of it. If if you don't have yourself in order, then the rest of it sort of doesn't matter. Uh, absolutely, and this, like this is an area that I kind of wanted to drill into with you. Know, I was a bit I was kind of curious to get your take on it as well because I mean so. So I, I found that probably I don't know maybe sixty or seventy percent maybe more of the the pressure as, as in the preparation it's almost kind of a a relief to depart um, but also I guess the opposite of having some anxiety or being on edge is complacency and you know complacency is is not something you want to have um, and you know as you know more than I do you know adventure sailing sounds really cool and and the footage looks amazing but you know the risks can be high high too and sometimes it's just one or two things that can set off a chain of events that can then become, you know, quite serious or even catastrophic. And I know, I know when I head offshore uh, on a passage that that I, I I accept that other people's lives are in my hands, and it, it adds a whole extra layer of responsibility. And even mentally, in some ways, I you know, it's kind of tougher than sailing with friends or sailing shorthand or even sailing solo. Uh, and so I was curious to to really understand how how you manage that responsibility, and 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 does it sometimes take the the fun out of sailing because that extra that extra layer of pressure or anxiety or or that on edge that's kind of almost always there um, that's 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 healthy but also it's taxing sometimes too I think yeah so um, it definitely doesn't take the fun out of it for me and I, I and I'll compare it this is I, I compared it to this in that article I wrote but I used to play golf competitively and it's the same the the feeling I used to get 
at the beginning of a big tournament or a big match where you're standing on the first tee and you've had you've got these high expectations and you've been training and you're ready to go. Um, same thing, you know, more recently, me and I have done a bunch of marathon running and stuff, though that's less competitive. It's more just for fun. But anyway, back in my golf days, I used to get those butterflies and and, and that was like that was why you did it. Like those feelings were the adrenaline and everything. That was freaking awesome. And I, I really I really excelled in that kind of pressure where, you know, you, you have the pressure, but it's sort of the pressure because you want to do well and you've trained for it and you're ready for it. And now you're executing this and 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 can actually do it. So I, I compare it like that's, I think, the balance you want to get or at least I want to get in the kind of sailing we do is to feel those butterflies and feel that pressure. But in an exciting way and in a way that keeps you on edge so that you're paying attention, so that you're conscious. And one thing that we've actually had to do this year, because last year was so high stakes, um, you know, that feeling was there by default. And this year has been a huge relief. I mean, I'm talking to you right now, crew come tomorrow, we're in, sitting in Las Palmas about to sail across the Atlantic. And it's almost silly to think that like, I'm not even really thinking about this passage because it'll be, you know, we've done this a bunch of times before. Um, but, but it's still, it's still super high stakes. You know, we're going across the Atlantic. It's a 3000 mile passage almost. Um, but it feels, you know, I'm sitting here in shorts and a t-shirt and the sun's out and it's beautiful outside. And it's just, it's harder to find that balance of pressure because I just don't, it feels too easy. And that's where things I think can get dangerous. Like you said, complacency. So we've reminded each other, like we need to stay on top of things. And that's where having checklists and having, you know, my friend Ryan and I have been doing this little podcast series on my, on my other podcast, the, how I think about sailing on risk management and decision making. And, and this is one of those instances where you need to get this stuff. I need to get this stuff out of my head because it's not, it's not in the back of my head by default. So I need to somehow remind myself to stay on edge and, and feel a little bit of that pressure in order to make sure that I don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And th that's right. Just because you've done, you know, 20, 50, a hundred thousand sea miles and, and done things successfully doesn't mean the risks aren't even aren't still there, but it's amazing the confidence that comes with once you've done something one or two or three or four or five times, it's a, it's a, it's a healthy confidence, but it's, it's a, it's a balance to not then, have complacency uh, creep in in terms of how relaxed you are in your approach. And checklists are a great idea for forcing yourself to go through every detail rather than just the things that are top of mind. Um, and particularly where you haven't had problems before or something, it's, it's easier to think you're not going to have problems next time either. Um, so it's well, that's it. I mean, you ha you you can't you can't make the assumption that just because just because the rig was great on the last passage doesn't mean you don't have to check it before the next one. And that kind of stuff. And and the reason it was good on the last passage is precisely because you did all the work to check it. So like that ongoing stuff is I think that's what I focus on as a way to keep things keep things going. I mean, as I'm talking right now, this is a, st a stupid example, but me is outside doing varnish because it's like, yeah, the varnish looked good last year, but it looked good last year because the year before she put seven coats on it. So you kind of have you just it never ends. You got to keep it up. And and um, to go back to your whether it's still fun or not, it's it's like that pressure. I, I want to find a way to, to make it feel like it felt when I stood on the first tee of a golf tournament where you're super excited because you're in the moment you're there. And I think when that feeling goes away, well, you might as well do something else, because what's the point? That's that's the feeling you're going for, that balance of adrenaline, but less, ang you know, more adrenaline, less anxiety, but still paying attention and being in the moment that's that's exactly why we do this mm. and i think um i mean for me personally i found it gives me the opportunity now to go to places that i wouldn't be able to get to or or, or get to and you know in the time frame i do so it's like a blend of things i know and can do comfortably as well as pushing boundaries and going to new places where where you know clients come along with you um as crew and you get to explore um, them for the first those locations for the first time like it's their first time and it's kind of like you know Christmas Christmas Day all over again because it's new for you as well um, and so that I think that's kind of an important blend to make sure that the the variety and challenge and stimulus is still there and it doesn't turn into a a bit of a you know commercial airline pilot going from A to B and back to A that you've done five or ten times already kind of thing 
Yeah, that's exa- that's a great analogy. Um, and I, I will say one more top, one more note on the anxiety thing. I'm entirely speaking for myself here because I've, you know, some of the people I've interviewed on the podcast where we talk about fear and anxiety and stuff, there are certain people that are simply, they just don't have that gene in them or whatever that is. Like Matt Rutherford's probably the best example. I mean, I, when I ask him about this, I actually don't think he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I truly don't th- like, it's not like he manages his anxiety or anything. He just, I don't think he knows what I mean. I just don't think he feels those same emotions. And there's a lot of people, I think uh, Robin Knox Johnson's like that too. There's just some of these people that, and I think you probably need to have that or or lack of that gene in order to accomplish some of these really crazy things that these guys have done because they just don't, they don't feel fear the same way that I do. And I've, and, and that, I think right there, that realization that, okay, well, just because they feel it differently doesn't mean I can't do those same things. It just means that I need to think about it a little bit differently because I've got one more layer of, uh, of preparation to deal with because they just don't, they don't have that. Um, and so it's kind of funny. I ask these, you know, you can kind of tell that sometimes I'll, I'll ask a question about fear and, and they'll kind of give like a weird sort of very circuitous, circuitous answer. And then I realized like, no, actually you have no idea what I just asked you. You, you, you don't <laughs> process that in the same way. And I, I find that fascinating. Uh, I, I, I'm like, you. I'd rather have that higher level of concern and, and, and have a hundred things I check off every time than be blissfully unconcerned and almost, um, blase. Um, and I've listened to Matt a couple of times and he's, such a fascinating character and such a likable character, but he he comes across as just completely fearless and completely almost unaware of some of the things he's done that are super high risky that he's just almost, you know, just quite humorous about it in a really laid back kind of way. And it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a fascinating contrast. Yeah, it is. It is for sure. And I, I, I don't have that. I, I need to manage, like I said, I need to manage myself, but, uh, but yeah, there it is. Um, okay, so so jumping back a little bit, I, I remember the early days with Esbjorn and, and your early episodes about some of your business challenges and expenses and risks and stresses, and and now it seems like you've really grown into 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 your role into the business, and you take it so much more in your stride and with so much more confidence, and that's really become evident just just so I guess hearing your sort of change in tone and how you how you talk about the business, and I guess for you with the the evolution, Andy, over the last three years, what's What's different about Andy Shell today compared to when you first launched this business, um, maybe around three years ago now, um, if I recall, and and you know the challenges you've had to face along the way. Yeah, so the business as it is now started in 2015. So this will be, well, yeah, five years, I guess. This is our fifth season. 2019 is our fifth fifth season on the boat. So, um, I think, I think the the way it's evolved, uh, it's, it's interesting that you notice a change in my tone. And I think when I think about it, I think you're probably right. And I think that change is because everything was new and I had ideas for how I wanted to make this evolve. And those ideas were based on, you know, we've had a lot of mentors over the years between John Kretschmer and John and Amanda Neal are the two biggest ones. Cause we, you know, effectively just modeled our business after, after what they were doing. Um, but that I've also had a lot of my own ideas when it comes to the podcast and the media stuff like that. And I didn't know how, I didn't know if it was going to work or not. And I didn't really know what specifically I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it with that. And Mia and I were actually just reflecting this morning over coffee that like we, for whatever reason, some of these ideas we've had over the years have actually worked. And I think that's where the confidence comes from now, instead of like, experimenting with different things. I know what works and what doesn't work and I know how to do things and I'm finding that I know how to do things pretty well in my own way. It might not be right or wrong. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not really, I'm, I'm sort of coming up with this stuff as I go. So as far as like marketing stuff, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm doing it quote unquote right, but it's working. Um, and I feel like I, I know now where to spend my time, like from an efficiency standpoint, where do I need to put my effort to get the most out of it? And then where can I sort of just play around because it's fun? Like, the, the, for example, the, the YouTube stuff we're doing, um, that, that's really just a, scratching a creative itch because I, I get bored doing the same stuff over and over again. And I'm actually shocked that I've stuck with the podcast for as long as I have because 
um, I tend to want to evolve or change things. And, and we actually, I was thinking about changing the podcast a little bit this year. And then Mia and I both said, nope, you know what? It works the way it is. And as, as podcast listeners ourselves, we really like the familiarity of like some of these shows that we've listened to for, you know, five or 10 years and they're still the same and the intro music's the same. And like, it's just very comfortingly familiar. So we've sort of said, all right, well, some things we're going to keep exactly the same, the podcast being one of them, and other things we're going to evolve and experiment with um, where there's no real downside. Uh, so I think, yeah, I guess just having the confidence because now we sort of we know what works. Um, and I, I will say, though, there's still, of course, there's always like anxieties about the business stuff. I mean, still to this day, every time we put out a new trip on the calendar, we're like, oh, man, I wonder if anybody's going to sign up. And, and <laughs> they always do. But uh, and I guess, yeah, I think I think that's that's sort of it. I feel like we know I feel like we have a nice template that works. And but also the realization that we need to keep evolving and improving on that, because as soon as we get complacent with this other stuff, we know we need to remain the leaders in this, what we're doing and set, we need to set the standard for everybody else. I don't want to see, I don't want to see other people doing this, come up with an idea that I should have thought of in the first place. So we've tried to stay one step ahead of everything else, um, uh, from that standpoint. But at the same time, you know, I'm super competitive, but I've also learned that the more you give away, the more you get back. So I'm very conscious of helping out other people because we've had so much help along the way ourselves and that just it's all karma right it all comes back yeah absolutely and the constant evolution and innovation keeps you fresh and keeps you hungry really doesn't it? keeps you thinking and keeps you evolving and that that's a that's a healthy way of approaching it um so in terms of your personal leadership style have you have you stopped and thought about how that's evolved over the last five years I and mean, how you approach leadership then versus now um that's a good question. Uh, I don't think it's really changed. I think, I think what I've learned is like the, the leadership stuff for me kind of comes naturally because I'm so passionate about it. Like, I think that just comes by default. Like I don't really, I don't really think about it that much because when I get crew on the boat and when we start getting the boat ready for a trip and actually go offshore, like I love it so much that it just sort of, it just sort of happens. And I know that's not a very clear answer, but like, I think, you know, when you, you talk about like leadership from a standpoint of te you know, are leaders born or are they made or that, that kind of stuff. I think it just depends on where you put them. I think anybody can be a leader. If it's, if you stick somebody who is, you know, take any person and ask them, what are they most passionate about? And then say, okay, I want you to take that and teach it to somebody else. They're going to be able to do that. So I think it's more about like, do you, are you in the right thing for what you're truly passionate about? And then it just kind of comes out and I, and that's where I'm at now. Like I, there's nothing else I want to do. So I, I get to do this and, and the leadership thing I think comes secondary to the fact that I'm just so excited to share this with everybody else that it's just, it's easy to be a leader in that sense because it's not work. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and leaderships, if you're enjoying something, then this there's less stress in, in, involved. So it's easier to have a a very open and a relaxed leadership style as opposed to people who do things they don't like doing it at all, and 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 then they bring the stress to the role as well. Um, and I guess to to specifically answer some question about like what what defines my style, I, I do think about this a bit in terms of. The teaching style anyway that I, I learned this from uh, I took a course maybe 10 years ago on teaching English as a foreign language and they the, the course I had emphasized uh, especially with a foreign language because it's a foreign language it, eliciting information from people as opposed to telling them so for example uh, if you have a classroom full of people who speak uh, a different we were I was in the Czech Republic so you have this classroom full of people who speak Czech well inevitably in that classroom there's going to be some people that have a few words of English, some who have none at all, and some who have more than others. So like if you're trying to come up with some new vocabulary, you might in very basic English, um, you know, say something that prompts one of the students in the classroom to, to, to give you the word you're looking for instead of them telling you. And when you do that style of teaching, it sticks more as a group. So you can use the, the strengths and weaknesses of the group. So for example, when we're doing 
our navigation briefing. I don't teach it. I basically ask them a series of questions because everybody's had some experience with navigation. So I'll just ask a series of questions that they'll then answer and then we'll summarize that and rehash it and make sure everybody gets the concept because inevitably somebody's, you know, more experienced than the other. So they'll come up with the answer and then I'll make sure that the other three people around the table, they're on the same page. But when you do that sort of eliciting, um, it sticks more. People only need to hear it once because they're, it's, it's a light bulb in the brain. You ask them the right leading questions and they say, oh yeah, I got, I got that. And then it's there. You only need to say it one time. Um, as opposed to giving a lecture on sail trim, nobody's going to remember that stuff. But if you ask them, I can't think of anything specific examples right now because it's just off the top of my head. But you, it, the idea is you ask a series of leading questions so that the people effectively teach themselves. Um, that's the same way I teach celestial. And, and and that's the most effective way of of teaching somebody. How that applies to leadership, I guess, is uh, that's the whole point. But I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how my style has been eliciting information from people. And, and I am very hands off. I don't even take a watch on the boat. I don't, I, I tend to, you know, I look at the, the trips are successful, the less that I am driving the boat, grinding winches, standing on the foredeck. Um, if I do nothing, that means then the crew was comfortable in their roles and they run the boat. I'm just there as the conductor, so to speak. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, there's just that analogy you gave about giving a lecture versus, I mean, versus drawing the knowledge out of people and then helping them fill the gaps in between them um, with what the kind of group knows. It makes a lot of sense because they're forced to they're forced to interact and engage when you do that. Whereas you can give a lecture and you can you don't know who's engaged and who's not and who's thinking about something else. But when they've we're forced to contribute and interact, um, then it changes the whole learning experience so oh, that's really fascinating yeah so so humor me for a second david here i have a, this is a, a good example that i always lead my celestial conversations l this way first of all do you do you do you know celestial okay so all right this will be perfect all right so when you teach celestial it's my favorite thing about it is that it's you never have to pick up a sextant and actually reduce a site to become a better navigator by understanding the, the concepts behind Celestial. So the first thing I always talk about is like simple geography. So you understand the concept of the tropics. Is that, is that a good assumption, correct assumption, right? Okay, so, so what lines of latitude, what line of latitude is the Tropic of Capricorn in your hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere? What line of latitude is that? Uh, I'm asking you. I don't know. Um... Okay, so I'll tell you, it's 23 and a half degrees south. Now, with that knowledge, what line of latitude is the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere? Um, possibly 23 and a half degrees north. You are absolutely correct. 23 and a half degrees north. Now, people tend to think of the tropics as being just this sort of area where there's a lot of palm trees and beaches, right? But the tropics are actually defined by the limits of the sun's declination on the surface of the earth. And that means that the travel of the sun north and south. So, for example, on June 21st, if you were standing on the surface of the earth and the sun is directly overhead on June 21st, where would you be standing? June 21st, the sun's directly overhead. Um, you... How about how about December? Dece what do you know about December twenty first? You're in the oh, southern so, hemisphere. Okay, so that's, that's yeah. So I'm trying to think of hemisphere. So so that's probably our longest day of the year. Um, in, December twenty first is your longest day of the year. So where would the sun have to be? Is the sun further? Is the sun north of you or south of you? Ah, uh, so on 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 the longest day of the year, it's going to be further south of us. Um, so how far? I just said the tropics define the limits. So if that's as far south as the sun is ever going to get. On December twenty first, where is the sun? Uh, at the tropics, um, twenty three. At the at the Tropic of Capricorn. Yep, 20, at twenty three and, and a half degrees south. Yeah. So then, therefore, now we move ahead in time. March twenty first. Where is the sun going to be on March twenty first? It's going to be. Sorry, we'll, let's skip ahead. June June twenty first. If if December twenty first is the is your longest day of the year and our shortest, on June twenty first, that's the northern hemisphere's shortest day of the year. Uh, sorry, longest and your shortest. So where would the sun be then on June 21st, six months later? 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. Exactly, on the Tropic of Cancer. So then at the in spring and fall, where do you think the sun is on spring and fall? It's on its way north and then it's on its way south. So March 21st and September 21st, where would the sun be if it's about halfway? Yeah, right. So it's going to be like 11 or 12 degrees. Uh, wow. 
No, it's, it's going to be think the about this way. It's we call be the, them the, it's we, be the quieter. Exactly. Because we call them the, the, the autumnal or the fall and the spring equinox, mm. equinox equator. Ah, of course. So these, th- these things like seasons and the tropics, this is not just somebody just didn't take a map and say, well, everywhere from Florida to Australia, we're going to call that the tropics. Well, no, actually, the tropics are defined by the limits of the sun's travel over the surface of the earth. And if you graph that through the course of a year, it creates a sine curve. And it, it, its limits are 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south. Furthermore, those limits are there because the Earth is tilted. And guess what? You guess what the angle of the Earth's tilt is? Mm, 23 degrees. It's an easy one. 23 and a half degrees, exactly. <laughs> so the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees off vertical. And guess what? The Arctic Circle. How many degrees south of 90 degrees north do you think the Arctic Circle is? Mm, 23 and a half degrees. <laughs> it is. And the Arctic Circle this is, is like at one of those, 62 this is like one of those, and a half degrees north. This is like one of those game shows where you're waiting for the trick question and there isn't a trick question. No. It's, so it's the, my point with this is, first of all, that was an example of how I would do an, an eliciting information from people. Um, but the point of it in celestial terms is, None of this stuff is made up. Everything is based on nature and geography. And right off the bat, just those small things, you're, you're now enlightened just a little bit to how the seasons and how the sun works and how the earth is tilted and all this stuff. And it's, it's not made up. Like you don't learn that part of it in science class. You learn it in the numbers, but you, don't, you, don't, you didn't remember those numbers. But now if you can picture it as what's happening in the real world as the seasons change and why are the seasons changing, all of a sudden it clicks and I guarantee you'll remember that now. Mm, I will. I can picture that now, and just it just makes complete sense as well. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. That's that's my leadership style in a nutshell. That's very good. That's very impressive. And I um, I really felt on the spot there, but that was all right. <laughs> I, it was. <wasn't>, <laughs> you was, did good. You did it good. Was, it wasn't too painful. Um. So so question for you, and I, you know, I, I probably out of every ten people I meet, and I say, have you heard of Andy Shell's podcast? Uh, and this is in Australia or New Zealand. At least eight, if not sometimes nine or ten, have heard of your podcast, and in most cases, actively listen to it. And so, I mean, do you do you ever stop and think about the the legacy you've created with that? And 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 when I say legacy, a number of people take up sailing because they've listened to your podcast, and and you've made it accessible, and you've de- de- demystified it to some degree. And and as a result, you know, you've got this audience that that follow you, but they you've helped you know fuel their passion, and and, and sometimes change how they spend their lives yeah mate it's it's scary actually and i i try not to think about it but at the same time i you know i don't deny the fact that like anybody else i have an ego and i try to be conscious of the fact of when my ego is sort of bubbling up to the surface and make making me feel good about myself when it's like you know it's (laughs) they have this cultural law in sweden called the jantalog which literally means like, don't think you're better than anybody else. So I have a very good sort of buffer to that ego because Mia is kind of the opposite of that. She, she's got that yantalog sort of baked into her culture. So she always reminds me if I get, if I get a too big of a head, she's like, hey, you're not better than anybody else. Um, so, but that said, of course, like it, it is, I think it's really cool. I, I'm super humbled by how many people we meet and it is it is exciting. Like my ego does like the fact that I I, I we meet people every literally everywhere we go on the boat. Um, within an hour of us arriving somewhere, that somebody will come over and say, "Hey, we listen, I listen to the podcast. Awesome job." And I like I I'm not going to deny that it doesn't feel good. I, it's it feels great. Um, and at the same time, it's it's also a really good motivator to to keep doing it. You know, I, I realized that it started as a way for me to do it, to scratch my own creative itch. And it still remains that, but like it's motivating to hear people listen to it and hear how much they like it. And, and it's like, okay, I'm, if there's a day where I just don't feel like doing it, uh, I'll just, I'll see an email from somebody and it'll be like, okay, I am going to do it now because there actually is people listening to this and I am making a difference. Um, and I've also been really careful. I hope this has been clear anyway. I've been really careful to talk about my own experiences instead of telling people what to do um, because I don't know all the answers. And, and, and I am like in that sense, I am actually, I don't think I have too much of an ego because I, I'm learning as I go. Uh, I make mistakes and I'm trying to 
vocalize those mistakes and also not tell people what to do because that might change. And I, all I know is what I do. I just, I just read a book, uh, this guy, Nassim Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan, which he's most famous for, but he wrote a book called Skin in the Game. And I was struck by the fact that like, I, I share a lot of that philosophy that's in this book. But the point of the book is like, you really can't, you know, he, he relates it to the stock market. Don't ask a stockbroker what you should invest in. Ask them what they're invested in because they've got skin in the game, literally. So people tend to ask me about boats. Like, what do you like about boats? It's like, well, I bought a Swan 48 for a reason. I don't know about the other boats because this is what I bought. So I'm, I'm trying to be more conscious of that and sharing my experiences and then say, okay, well, why did you buy that Swan 48? Here's the things I like about the boat. Here's some other boats that I have actually sailed on before that I really like, but I still didn't buy one. So, you know, that I think, I think that is a way to sort of manage that ego and say, all right, well, yeah, I think I've done a lot of things right, but I don't, I can't speak for anybody besides myself. Um, and yeah, it's cool to meet people from everywhere we go. And, and the legacy thing, th that's one thing I struggle with when we're looking at expanding the business. You haven't asked me yet about the second boat. Um, so I was kind of waiting to talk about that, but it's, it's on my list. I'm coming to that. <laughs> so we, we got the second boat thing. And part of it is that I just, I, I don't know why, but I just have this gut feeling that I'm, me and I were talking about this the other day. I, I like, when I was in high school and college and stuff, things came fairly easy to me with school and I was naturally talented at golf and I didn't have to try very hard to be reasonably successful in school and in, in the sports that I played. Um, but one of my criticisms of a couple of teachers who were really hard on me in a good way was that I was not fulfilling my potential because I had all this natural talent, but I was wasting it because I wasn't training it. And I feel now I'm sort of in that similar situation where I'm reminded like this potential thing. It's like, yeah, we could sort of rest on our laurels and keep keep Eastbjorn and, and sail half the year and have half the year off and and it would work fine. But I feel like that if I did that, I'm not reaching my potential. Like I feel like I have a lot more to give. Um, and I and I and I'm not going to know if I don't try. So I've I've really been conscious of the fact of be, going back to like doing your best, I think I can do better. Um, but it also scares me because I know I'm taking on a lot more responsibility. Um, so I guess that's a very long winded answer, but I hope I answered your question. I don't even remember what it was at this point, but, but that, that's what I've been thinking about. Okay. No, you did. And, and, and interestingly, like, you know, legacy is a double edged sword because you've, you've got this passionate audience. And so I'm sure you feel the obligation to keep producing content. And I'm sure that if, if the day comes, well, the year comes where you decide I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm, I'm sure that'll weigh heavily on you if that time does come because you know you've got you've got that audience and that expectation, um, which is an interesting one um, given the the career. Actually, I think I, I I see your point, but I actually think it's gonna. I think it'll be easy. I think when the day comes that the, I'm more passionate about something else, then that it's gonna be like flipping a switch. I'm, I'm not really worried about that because I'm not at that point now, and there's no point in thinking about it. There, I've read a great quote in a. Haruki Murakami is a Japanese author I read a lot, and he has a, a memoir about running. He's also a runner. There's a great quote in there that said, you don't know, nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. Or no, how did it say? It was, you have to wait, you have to wait for tomorrow to find out what tomorrow will bring. And it's a, such a simple line, but mm. it's so true. And it's like, well, I don't really, I don't really think about, I try not to think about that stuff because... Yeah, one day I, I f actually fear that one day I might not be as passionate about sailing as I am right now. But what's the point of fearing that day if I am passionate about it right now? I'll I'll cross that bridge when we get there. And when the time comes and we get there, then the podcast is going to end, and I might become a farmer, and who knows? But whatever I, whatever it is, I'm going to find. You know, I can't. I won't be able to sit still. I'll find something, and and then I'll do my best at whatever that thing is. But for for now, that thing is sailing. Yeah, well, that sums it up perfectly. And on on the topic of sailing, I one 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 thing I really want to, I guess touch on before we wrap up is the the decision you made uh, to add you know the beautiful stunning 59 foot swan that you've named ice bear to your business and when i read that i thought wow that's incredible and for me seeing you do that was was um, incredible in the sense that i heard some of your early anguishes over east beyond and some of the 
challenges you had and the work you had to do and then to to take that step up to adding um, a yacht of that kind of you know size and scale to your to your business and and, and you know putting in place that twelve month kind of trial to see how it goes. I thought that was an amazing step, um, and so I was excited to read about it. But I'm really keen to ask you about you know how how that decision came about and whether it was a difficult decision that you laboured on for a while or it just was an instinctive kind of oh yeah that's the next step. You know I, I think I'm going to do that. Um, I'm curious to see how how you came to that kind of decision. Yeah, everything, everything we've decided has, it, it's all gut feelings, like in a good or bad way. I, you know, I, I tend not to, ma- I tend to make decisions um, emotionally, uh, which is to my chagrin sometimes, but also, you know, we've been successful. So going back to that confidence thing, it's like, well, I, I've trusted my gut <clears throat> all along and it's worked out for the most part. Uh, sometimes I've regretted it, but you know what, it's just, that's, that's the way, that's how I've calibrated my decision-making. And that, this was just the same, similar sort of thing. I just had it in the back of my head, like going back to that potential thing. I, I felt like we could do more. Um, and I felt like I, we've, we've met and created enough of a network of other people like me, um, that I think can run, can, can be skippers. You know, our, our goal is to create, create a 59 North sailing experience where, ultimately people want to sign up to sail with us and it doesn't matter which boat or which skipper they have they're going to get the same sort of philosophical experience and each person that we work with is going to share the same philosophy that i have but also bring something unique to the table that makes them unique you know it's 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 that that's kind of the overarching goal but to to buy the boat you know it was a it was a happy accident because Everybody, I think, no matter what boat you have, is always looking on Yacht World at other boats. And and I had had this second boat idea in my head for a little while. And then sailing with Delos was super inspiring. And they were talking about Delos 2.0 and this stuff they're going to do. And and I started looking again in earnest, like, wow, maybe we sh- maybe we can do this. And um, this this specific Swan 59 we had met before back in 2009. Wow. And the boat had been on the market. So I emailed the broker and I said, hey, I have this crazy idea. I want to rent the boat. I saw it was in Antigua. We're going to be in Antigua. So long story short, everything came together. And you can read the whole story on my – it's on my blog uh, on our website. Um, but basically the whole thing came together in that the, the owner was keen. We had met – we had a previous sort of relationship with the boat having seen it before in a rally. Um, it had been sort of just sitting on the market. And he said, "Yep, let's let's make a deal. You can use it. I just want the boat to be used." He's a he's a really cool guy in that he just realizes that that you know this Swan 59 with an 11 foot keel and an 80 foot rig, it's meant to be sailed across oceans, and uh. it's just been sitting in Antigua for a year. He's like, "I want." He's like, "I don't." It's like I don't need to make money out of this rental deal. I just want somebody to use the boat and then and maintain the boat. So, it was a really happy little thing that all came together with a lot a lot of you know i i like a story there's a good story there because of the relationship we had and the the way the owner feels about it and the fact that now he's allowing he's a businessman himself he's allowing us to test the concept without putting out you know a ton of money to buy it and um but we have the option to buy it if we want to buy it so it keeps us it leaves us flexible makes a good story and and it allows us to sort of attempt this without a ton of financial risk and you know, I'm probably most proud of the whole thing where we've had a ton of help with the business, but to this day, uh, we haven't, we haven't had to take any money from anybody from the bank, from other than a, you know, a loan on the, on Eastbjorn. We don't have any loans. We don't have any credit card debt. We don't have any investors. It's just us. We've bootstrapped the whole thing. And I'm really proud about that. And, uh, to be able to do that, to try to expand in a similar way is, is really cool. Oh, it's a huge credit to you. I think it's, I think it's a fantastic story. Um, and and how different does it feel um, starting a fifty nine foot yacht to forty eight? Because it doesn't, it doesn't sound that much different. But you know, volume and weight wise, and rig height, and you know, all the loads and everything you're working with, it's a, it's a different scale again, isn't it? Yeah, I, I actually haven't even seen the boat yet since we made this deal. We're gonna see it in two weeks, and it well, three weeks right. when we get to Antigua. That'll That'll be the first time since 2009 that we will have actually oh, seen the boat. Yeah, all, right. This whole deal came together purely through email. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I was thinking you're yeah. doing some selling already. Wow. Okay. To, so you got all no, that, all I, that I ahead of you. I, I have to give a shout out to Rob Clark from RU Sailing, which is based in Lagos, Portugal. 
Rob was the former skipper on uh, Tindra, which is what the boat is called currently. Um, and Rob basically, the deal I made with the owner, he sent Rob down for two months to Antigua to like basically not refit, but recommission. The boat's been sitting on the hard for a year. So Rob did a whole bunch of work on the hard, launched the boat, sailed it all the way down to Grenada, and it's on its way back right now. I think they're in St. Lucia, back to Antigua. So huge shout out to Rob. And if anybody's in Europe and wants to learn how to sail, Rob's got an amazing sailing school. Like I said, rusailing.com. Uh, uh, that's in Lagos, Portugal. And he has been the hero of this story because he's doing all the dirty work and I'm going to get to Antigua and the swan's going to be in the water, cleaned up, ready to go, recommissioned. And he's, he's spent a lot of bl blood, sweat and tears getting that boat ready for us. So a big shout out to Rob. And, um, and I think that that won't be the last time that listeners of this podcast hear from him. I think he'll, he'll have something to do with this going forward. Cause I've, I'm really impressed with the work he's done so far. So, so thanks to Rob if he's listening. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And that's really exciting, uh, really, really exciting for you in terms of the next step forward with your evolution and with your business and with the, the adventures that then sort of unfolds uh, in terms of a, you know, another new chapter. Yeah, what you asked about sailing a bigger boat, some of our, you know, that's one thing I was actually worried about is, is the boat going to be too big for the people that want to sail with us? Because most of the people that sail with us, you know, they, they, they want to do this on their own boat. And, you know, a 60 footer is not really. That's not really your average family cruiser, is it? Um, but my answer to that is, and it's down, to, it's like anything else. It, it's purely down to the leadership. I, I tell them, look, I'm going to be on that boat. You're going to, you know, it's going to be a, an, an added challenge, but we're going to make it easy, not easy, but we're going to make it fun and, and attainable. And then the, the benefit is you get off of that 60 footer and go back to your family 40 footer and it's going to feel like a dinghy. So I think that that added sort of degree of difficulty it's my challenge. It's my job. And this is where I feel like back to the potential thing. I'm, I'm ready for another challenge. I, I want to feel like what it, what's it going to be like parking that, that boat stern two on a dock with no bow thruster. Cause it doesn't have a bow thruster. You know, I I'm, I'm excited for that challenge. And, and my bigger challenge as a leader of the crew is to make that boat feel easy to sail for the crew that is with us so that then they have then leapfrogged their abilities so when they go back and sail on their family boats or charter or whatever, it's it's much uh, you know it's that much easier going forward. So that that's the challenge for me, and I and I really look forward to that challenge. Okay, well that that, that makes a lot of sense, and that's a, that's the thing. If people people are capably able to handle a boat of that size and scale, and and, and all the challenges that come with that, then then anything they ask they go back to um, suddenly seems quite easily achievable, doesn't it? In terms of what they do, it just yeah. it's amazing how you stretch your horizons like that. And something that seemed quite challenging seemed now seems quite simple. Um, so, I mean, so for you now, Andy, like where to from here? And what, you know, you talked at, at some stage about heading down to the Pacific um, as some, in, in a future year. Um, but, you know, with um, Ice Bear, what does that open up for you now in terms of new passages or new adventures? Or, or is it more scale on the, on, the, on the same kind of routes you've been doing? Or what, 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 what kind of lies in the future for you? Um, I mean, Pacific's like definitely the next sort of big thing when is the only question like uh, uh i talked about this before after spitzberg and that was such a big sort of unattainable thing that we'd set for ourselves where the last five years really uh everything was working towards that and and i actually have to admit it feels really nice just to be back in familiar you know the next the calendar for this year and next year is all trips we've done before so that we'll have the added challenge of two boats and and the bigger boat but we don't have any extra pressure as far as the schedule where we're going. And, I, and I'm really enjoying going back to places we've been before and, and having a little bit less pressure on the logistical side of things from, from that standpoint. So, but at the same time, I've, I'm always, I've always been a goal driven person. And I, I know, uh, Mia actually said this to me and put it in good terms because I was kind of lamenting the fact that it's like, well, I don't, I don't really know what my next really big challenge is going to be after Svalbard. I feel like kind of a little bit of a letdown, and she's like, just, just let it come to you. She's like, just relax and enjoy, you know, reflecting on the success of last year, stay in the moment on this year. And then if you leave enough space to breathe, the next thing's going to come to you. And whether the next big, big thing is Antarctica or Cape Horn or something, there, there's going to be another one of those big milestones because I, I know my personality and I just can't, you know, Svalbard, we've done that. Um, maybe it's Greenland. Maybe, I, I don't know what it's going to be. 
having done Svalbard and done it successfully basically gives me the confidence to think that everything is on the table now. Like there is nothing that's, that's not attainable because I know how to work through it and I know the steps along the way. And, and as far as managing the challenges, like that gave me a ton of confidence to think like, I don't know what the next thing's going to be, but I know we'll be able to do it if we just put our minds to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about it in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's quite unique with you and me are both being involved in, in a business like this and, and the time you get to spend together on and off the water. And, and does, does the winter climate that you, that you have to deal with, um, with where you live in Sweden, does that help you kind of in a forced kind of way to not over schedule by, by having to have time back on land and having to plan around the seasons more so than maybe, you know, some of the people that live in other parts of the world where the seasons aren't as harsh uh, in the winter? Mm, I don't know if it affects our sailing schedule because that really depends on the weather, but it just kind of so happens by default that most of the time when we're off, it happens to be winter back at home. But I actually, you know, we I, I say I like the Swedish winter, but then again, I don't have to deal with it for nine months like most people that live there. But but I do, in, in our breaks, I do like being home in the wintertime because it, it forces you when we're home to sort of relax a bit more. You can't, you know, it's dark all the time and I just am outside splitting wood and going running and stuff and being out in my gym. So it's kind of like, it's kind of a nice way to, to, to hibernate in between trips. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as scheduling our own sailing trips, that's more to do with like hurricane season and, and where we're actually going. But, but I, I can say I, I do enjoy the winters being home. Mm -hmm. And have you have you found the right mix now in terms of the time the time you schedule away on trips on the water and the time you spend at home or the time or the or the breaks you schedule between trips in terms of not not getting into a kind of a, like an overload situation? Yeah, this year last year we had no trips, no time between trips at all because we wanted to you know we had Delos up in up in Svalbard and we we didn't leave ourselves any any time between trips. It was like one crew left one day and literally the next day the next crew would come and that was. We knew it was going to be like that, and we just sucked it up and dealt with it, and it was totally worth it. But now, you know, we've been sitting in Las Palmas for a week, uh, and we rented a car this past weekend and got an apartment up in the mountains and got off the boat, and, and we have at least a week between every trip this year, and we have, I think, four weeks um, between the race in Antigua and the next trip, the first trip on the big boat. So, like, when some of our family is going to come down and enjoy it. So that allowing ourselves time to breathe between trips in season – it's almost more important than giving us longer chunks when we're at home. Um, and we, we, we've learned that the hard way. Uh, and the next, this schedule this year, and next year, we've allowed ourselves at least a week between trips. And, and, and that's how we, you know, me and I get to enjoy being on the boat, just the two of us and doing some actual normal cruising without having a boatload full of people all the time. So that, that's been really impor important to us as much as, as it is going going home. Yeah, that's kind of nice, and, and you can really enjoy the journey as well, kind of in parallel to what you do uh, from a business point of view. But also, it must be nice having just some extra extra latency built in for when things go wrong and things need repairing or replacing and and, and tidying up. Which you, you know, you always end up with a list of things you got to try and try and action in between trips. So that's kind of must be nice to have a bit more kind of wriggle room in between um, and removing yeah, that pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's excellent. Well, um, I've. You've exhausted my list of questions for you, so I, re I really appreciate um, you uh, jumping on the the call tonight or your morning um, at such short notice. Because I've I've been wanting to hook up with you for a long time for interviews, so it's been a real a real pleasure to be able to talk to you directly, Andy. Uh, I mean, is there anything else you want to share or add, or anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up? I mean, I'm I'm not pressured for time, but I'm just uh, conscious of your uh, your days just beginning, so you're, I'm sure you've got a list of things to do. Yeah, yeah, thanks. No, I mean, I don't know. I just some yesterday uh somebody asked for a quote, like a short and sweet quote and it, and I'll just like kind of leave people, you know, I, I tend to be pretty philosophical, but I I still think that it if you find and this applies to I guess there's going to be sailing people that listen to this, but but it applies to anybody. Like just it, it's not that hard. Like find the thing that you're most passionate about. And just work your ass off to do it, and it's like it's, and then it doesn't feel like work. I mean, I just, I'll, I'll keep saying that till I'm red in the face. I just feel like most of the world's problems are down to the fact that people are just not doing what they were meant to do. Like, just do what you're meant to do, whatever that is, and you'll be happy. I mean, it doesn't matter how hard you work for it; you're still gonna be happy. And that, that's been the journey, I guess, for me is, is realizing that 
I'm just going to work my ass off at what it is I love doing the most and, and we'll see what happens with it. Uh, and I have, I mean, I have it, it's a line my mom wrote in a note. I have it tattooed on my wrist and it says, hold fast to your dreams. Like that's, that's the best way I think to sum it up. And that's what, that's, what's going to push us forward. And I don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to be with that attitude. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. And uh, you're certainly a person that, that lives by, lives by that, um, that attitude. And, um, and, you know, I salute you for, for what you've achieved over the last six years and, and how generous you've been with helping others and, and the inspiration you provide to everybody. And, um, the standard you said is inc- incredible. And I, I personally enjoy following all of your, all of your work and, um, you've been a huge inspiration to me. So it's a real, it's a real honor to be able to talk to you today and, and interview you for the podcast and do a kind of a joint episode that we can publish, but, uh, to be able to interview the interviewer for a change. Yeah. Thanks, man. This has been a lot of fun. I, I love doing this and, and I, and I got it. We still, I still have to do the, the, the reverse to you here now because I think it's awesome. I'm extremely humbled that, you know, you've taken such inspiration and actually acted on it. And I, I'm really stoked for you and what you've been doing. And I've been I've been following you from afar as well. So, you know, the feelings mutual and, and, and to think that, like, we had some some part in your own success is is very humbling. And it's it's really uh, it's it's really cool to see. So if we do make it to Australia, don't you worry, you will be on my list of uh, of people to call to get some research and stuff. And you know, let's, let's plan one of these days, whenever that happens, that we rendezvous somewhere, somewhere, uh, in your neck of the woods. Uh, absolutely. That would be fantastic. And I, I certainly would love to head up your way, um, in the next couple of years and come sailing with you um, when the, when the timing is right. So, um, that would be, uh, that would be fantastic too. So, well, that's fantastic, Andy. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll, I'll drop you a note after this and we'll kind of organize the logistics and stuff. But, uh, that's really been excellent to, to talk to you at last. It really is fantastic. I mean, that sounds great, and and, uh, and thank you. Uh, and good luck with um, iSpare and your your expansion of the business and, and with your sailing adventures in 2019, and, and um, safe sailing. Thanks. Likewise. I'll talk to you later, David. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com. Dot .au See you next week People walk into me and say I'm sorry I want to look back I want to talk to them Sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before Some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up. Feelings are sad. I want to be mad. Days here are like precious gold. If you live another one, you have faith to carry on. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around. Watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft one too I painted a picture of the past I picture cold dark sand skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be with warm sun and a bright town so turn around and hear them speak so turn around and help them out turn around cause you're watching them cry 
watching some getting ready to die.